Hello, and welcome to Understanding Her Story, an anti-oppressive framework for helping professionals working with women. My name is Jason Jones, and I'm a social worker here at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research and the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York. We are pleased to bring you this conversation about anti-oppressive work that helps providers move from a clinical framework to a mindset that helps us understand our clients from a historical perspective. We are joined by Zoila Del Villar and Amanda Alcantara, who will get us started. Thank you for the introduction, Jason Jones, and thanks to those of you who are listening. Like Jason said, my name is Amanda Alcantara, and I'm the Communication and Program Manager here at the McSilver Institute, and also a journalist known as Radical Latina. I am joined by Zoila Del Villar. Zoila is a research scientist at McSilver's Step Up program with a background in community organizing and youth development. She is also the co-chair of the Anti-Oppressive Steering Committee here at McSilver. Zoila, can you start off by telling us what is anti-oppressive practice? Absolutely. Anti-oppressive practice is based on the concept of power and privilege and oppression. It addresses structural inequalities and their effects on people's lives. This approach is important for helping professionals because it can be incorporated through advocacy and mobilization with the overall end goal being to eliminate oppression through institutional and societal change. It's just really dope, Amanda. Anti-oppressive practice is not a traditional clinical practice. It's more of a mindset and a way of understanding and relating to the client. Well, Zoila, how does this apply to women in particular, uh, especially that being the topic of today's discussion? Women are oppressed group in society, particularly women of color, adolescent women, and elderly women. Just that makes it an important issue. Anti-oppressive practice encourages women who have been historically silenced to finally be heard. That is really interesting. Um, many of our audience members are actually helping professionals. Why or how does this apply to them and clinical work? Well, we have to keep in mind that women are 50% more likely than males to use mental health services. With that being said, helping professionals can apply anti-oppressive practice because it provides a wide range of approaches to achieve sustainable goals. It's also a collaborative process for both the client and the clinician and or helping professional. You know, Amanda, anti-oppressive practice allows the client to identify and discuss institutional racism and systematic oppression in a non-judgmental space, mm. which helps the client feel ownership of the therapeutic process. And uh, continuing on, what are some of the various conceptual frameworks within anti-oppressive practice that have been applied to work related specifically to women? Absolutely. That's a really good question. I like to think of anti-oppressive practice like a great accessory. It's like a pair of black shoes. You can mix and match with anything. For example, it goes well with various social justice approaches like feminist theory, anti-racist theory, Marxist theory, anti-colonial theory, just to name a few. It also goes well with motivational interviewing and CBT, which a lot of the helping professionals use. The cornerstone of anti-oppressive practice itself provides an understanding of power and focuses on the intersectionalities within women's experiences. Wow, that's really interesting, and it seems especially important in the climate in which we are right now in the U.S. What would you say is the ultimate goal of anti-oppressive practice and work beyond uh, just a therapeutic relationship? Yeah, Th there's a couple of goals. The main goal is to achieve equality and social justice for marginalized and oppressed groups like women. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, attempts to eradicate discrimination from the clinical process or the therapeutic process. So what you're telling me is making me think of intersectionality. Can you remind us of the role that intersectionality plays when working with women? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy you brought that up, Manda. Intersectionality plays a huge role in anti-oppressive practice because it looks at the various social identities and realities like a woman's race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and social class. You know I can go on. Yeah. <laughs> can you give us some examples of concrete techniques or components in anti-oppressive practice that a helping professional would find useful. Absolutely. Anti-oppressive practice educates people about unequal power and unjust social structures. It also challenges oppressive conditions and empowers people in their communities, and it focuses on the individual strengths, not weaknesses, like other approaches might. When a helping professional applies this with the client, it empowers you, the client, and then in turn, the client's community becomes empowered. As a helping professional myself, it then empowers me to challenge the system that I work within, which can be stifling for me and the client when dealing with the systems that perpetuate systematic oppression. So anti-oppressive practice helps with that. Exactly, Amanda. It challenges racist structures that the clients feel stuck in. Are there any criticisms to anti-oppressive practice? 
Totally. Folks working on the ground level find it really hard to use these concepts in their everyday practice. And it's also difficult to implement outside of research settings. Another criticism is that they aren't tangible ways for helping professionals to really use this, this knowledge. And I know maybe to help us understand this even more, right? I know you brought up some case studies today where anti-oppressive practice might have helped. Let's talk about those. Sure. I brought two in particular that I would like to talk about. Both are on the same topic that I find very important. One happened in a group setting and the other an individual counseling session. I was assigned to work with two girls of color in two separate schools who disclosed that they felt more comfortable sharing life experiences with me. When I asked why, they both stated that they had white women interns working with them previously, and they said that they wanted to protect the interns from their own life experiences as women of color. Both girls went on to say that they didn't think the interns would understand and kept their conversations very superficial to make the interns feel safe when working with them. Wow. Research has shown that when a client feels that their helping professional doesn't understand their experience or feel judged, they either stop coming to sessions or keep their conversations very superficial. If these white female interns had an anti-oppressive lens, I believe they would have challenged this. They would have, for example, asked, how do you feel about me being white? Or why can't we talk a little bit more about your life? Instead of, tell me about your experience being a girl of color in a bad neighborhood. Wow, that's very interesting because when you brought up the example, I thought the only solution was to just have people of color work with other people of color, which is still important. Absolutely. However, just because you have an anti-oppressive framework doesn't mean you and your client are a good match. What I'm really saying is that if these white women would have had an anti-oppressive framework, they probably would have been perfect matches for these young girls, but they didn't. And as a result, white fragility got in the way. That's uh, very interesting. And for myself as a woman of color, I would think that it's not only important for white clinicians to learn this framework, but for one, more people of color to have access to the field of social work, and two, for people of color or the field itself to become more anti-oppressive, anti-racist, uh, anti-other forms of oppression in and of itself. Absolutely, I agree. Please keep in mind that all students, but in our case, graduate students and the, and the high school students are taught under a white supremacist system that is often archaic and doesn't adapt to people of color. Mm -hmm. It's not these interns' fault that their approach just didn't work for this population. Right, right. Uh, can you share other examples with us? Sure. The other example is similar, but in a group setting. So I facilitate life skills groups with high school students. And in those groups, we usually have a facilitator, someone like myself, and two interns and a group of high school students. In this one group, we, the topic of discussion was race. We had two interns, one white female and one Latina female. The topic of discussion was race and ethnicity. As I kept probing on the question of race, the room became quiet and silence. And one, one student whispered to me, we can't talk about race, there's a white person in the room. My response to the young person in a, low, in a higher voice was that the white person is a room full of colored folk and that racism should be spoken about. And she took a deep breath and she said, okay. And I felt like there was a relief or a sense of relief once we spoke about a white person being in the room. So again, the example is really just to emphasize that white fragility has already been internalized by young people of color, and it really just plays out in different settings, clinical settings, whether it be in an individual counseling session or in a group session. And I can only imagine if it surfaces also in the intake process. And addressing white fragility, as you said, is actually part of the anti-oppressive practice, right? Yes, and in both situations, had interns had an anti-oppressive background, they would have challenged a young person to know that it's okay to talk about race in class with someone that doesn't look like you. So please let me just emphasize that anti-oppressive practice is not about white versus black, it's about the experience. Absolutely. Um, so having an anti-oppressive framework for helping professionals can truly encourage a kind of real two-way relationship that essentially leads to a better practice for the professional and a better healing, almost holistic, if you will, experience for the client. So to conclude today's podcast, Zoila, let's maybe go over some things that you brought up today. Anti-oppressive practice encompasses a wide range of approaches and looks to achieve sustainable goals institutionally, systematically, and individually. 
both for the client and the practitioner. Practitioners need to be, one, educated in anti-oppressive practice, and two, taught how to incorporate this in their everyday practice, which I understand is not easy. In addition, some things that I would add is that anti-oppressive practice provides an understanding of how people's intersecting identities are socially located with the oppressive systems. It challenges the belief that people can only be biologically and culturally defined. But identifying, naming, and challenging current oppressive system, it allows helping professionals to challenge racist and sexist structures and become producers of sustainable service delivery practices. And this is especially important, as is the topic of today's podcast, for women who, like your statistics said earlier, are more likely to receive mental health services than men and who often suffer silently within the system. Yes, Amanda, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of this insight, Soila. Thanks, Amanda, for joining me in this much-needed conversation. Absolutely. And thanks to everyone who will tune into this podcast. You can check out the rest of the webinars at mcsilver.nyu.edu slash gender.